Well, good evening and welcome. We are leaving the European Union for no good reason. Leaving because of a flawed referendum in which the majority of the electorate did not give their express agreement to leaving the European Union. A referendum in which many people who were directly affected by the outcome were denied a vote. A referendum in which all of the reasons to leave were based on lies and mistruths. A catalogue of awful lies which demeaned and undermined our democracy. It's the duty of all patriots to speak up when you can see danger ahead for your country. And for all of us who can see danger for Britain as a result of Brexit, have a duty to speak up. But in the main, of course, Brexiters have told us that we should instead shut up. We're told that the decision has been made and it cannot be undone. But anyone who says that doesn't understand democracy because anything democracy decides, democracy can also undo. One of the main functions of democracy is to give voters opportunities to change their minds. Otherwise, we could never vote a government out of office. Otherwise, a new government coming into office could never undo the democratic decisions of previous governments. So the question tonight, can Britain stop Brexit? Of course it can, if that's what Britain wants. But maybe at this stage, the more important question to ask is, should Britain stop Brexit? And to answer that question, I believe that we have to go back in time and look at why did the EU start in the first place? How did we get to join and how come we're leaving? And one of the reasons that this is so important is because the tragedy is that many people in Britain do not understand the origins of the European community. They think, because this is what they've been told, it was just about trade. It wasn't. Actually, the European community started in response to war, the most devastating war the world had ever known. The second of two world wars that originated on our continent of Europe. A war in which around 60 million people were killed and a new word, genocide, had to be invented to describe the indescribable, which was the systematic and industrial murder of many millions of people. So when peace came at last, after five gruelling years of war, there were two words that resonated across our continent of Europe and the world. Never again. Never again. And some of the greatest minds and most compassionate souls thought up initiatives in this post-war period to try and avoid something like this happening again because it was like we had lost humanity. And we started the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, NATO, and the European Coal and Steel Community, later to become the European Economic Community, and later to be called the European Union. All of these post-war initiatives were started for the same reason, to try and create peace and security and humanity after the most devastating war the planet had ever known. And in particular, our war leader, Churchill, great war leader, in the immediate post-war years, set his mind to thinking what would be the antidote to war on a continent that was infamous for its countries resolving differences between each other by violence and war. What was his answer to that? We must recreate the European family in a regional structure called, it may be, the United States of Europe. And the first practical step 
would be to form a Council of Europe. If at first all the states of Europe are not willing or able to join the Union, we must nevertheless proceed to assemble and combine those who will and those who can. So it was Churchill's idea, among others, to have a union of Europe as a whole. He is recognized as one of the 11 founders of today's European Union. And although at that particular time, he didn't envisage Britain being a member, he was later to change his mind. We cannot aim at anything less than the Union of Europe as a whole. And we look forward with confidence to the day when that union will be achieved. And so it came about on the 25th of March, 1957. Six countries came together. France, Italy, West Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg to create the European Economic Community. This was a remarkable achievement when you consider that these countries just a few years earlier were at war and one of these countries had subjugated most of the others in a terrible way. For them to get together so quickly after the Second World War is a big achievement and the reason they did it was not for trade. Trade was the means, but the goal was peace, peace on our continent. And four months later, Churchill gave a speech about the formation of the European community and said he welcomed the common market by the six, provided that the whole of free Europe will have access. And he added, we genuinely wish to join. And so in 1961, under the Tory premiership of Harold Macmillan, we applied to join the European community. And he told the country at the time, accession to the Treaty of Rome would not involve a one-sided surrender of sovereignty on our part, but appalling of sovereignty by all concerned, mainly in economic and social fields. In renouncing some of our own sovereignty, we would receive in return a share of the sovereignty renounced by other members. 1961. Today, Brexiters are telling us that the country was misled into being told that this was a, an organization just for free trade. Absolute nonsense. This was an organization to try and achieve peace, and it was, even then, considered a political union of countries. We were not misled. Messieurs, nous allons procéder à la signature des actes. And then, in 1972, Tory Prime Minister Edward Heath signed the EEC Treaty of Accession following six days of debate in Parliament. And then we were in, 1st of January 1973. We had joined, and notice the headlines in the newspapers then, who in the main were all pro are being in the European community, unlike today. There was a big change which we will come on to later. And then, in 1975, Prime Minister Harold Wilson, the Labour Prime Minister, decided to have a referendum similar to the one we had in 2016. Did Britain want to stay in the European community that we had only just joined a couple of years previously? And the question then was yes or no, do you think that we should uh, stay in the European economic community? And at the time, the Labour government sent to every household, a bit similar to how David Cameron sent a pamphlet to every household. I think this one was a lot better, uh, and actually it could have been printed today, and there wouldn't have been much difference uh, in it. Uh, and they sent this pamphlet and said that the first aims of the common market were to bring together the peoples of Europe, to raise living standards, and to maintain peace. Again, Brexiters say to us, that we were misled in that 1975 referendum into thinking it was only about free trade. We, we were hoodwinked. It isn't true. The pamphlet also said, as a member, Britain has a say in the future economic and political development of the common market. And if we left the common market, Britain would no longer have any say. And at the time, the leader of the Conservative Party, the opposition, Margaret Thatcher, she agreed and she said it's purely common sense to belong to a community working together in peace on economic and political issues 
that concern us all. Again, this is beyond just free trade. The result was overwhelming. Unlike in 2016, in 1975, UK voted to remain in the European community by a massive two to one. The issue was settled. Although I have to add, that didn't stop Eurosceptics at the time wanting to campaign for us to get out, even though they tell us today we should stop. And I'll come on to that later on. The European community, now the European Union, has been a remarkable success story. It's grown from its original six members to 28, with more wanting to join. And it's achieved its original aim of peace between members, because never has a, a shot been fired between a European Union country. The remarkable success story. Look at it. I mean, if you read some of the newspapers, you think the European Union is collapsing. The European Union is the world's largest economic region, the world's largest trading bloc, the world's largest exporter and importer of manufactured goods and services, and the list goes on. And for most of the 40-odd years that Britain has been in the European Union, there has not, it's not been a problem. There's not been a general election issue. People were not against our membership of the European community or as it became the European Union. It was on the periphery of the main parties. It was just one party UKIP. The vast majority of parliament supported our membership and our continued membership of the European Union. And why not? It was a success story and Britain was doing well. Before we joined the European community, we were known as the sick man of Europe. Our inflation and unemployment was high, and the countries of Europe were doing better than us. We wanted to join for the economic survival of our country because our empire was finished and our commonwealth was severely diminished. One year, one year before the EU referendum, the Independent ran a story to say that support for staying in the European Union was the highest it's ever been. The Evening Standard had run a poll and it showed that people in Britain wanted to stay in the EU by three to one, a much bigger proportion than even there had been in the 1975 referendum. And the Evening Standard at the time said in the editorial, the results indicate the highest support for EU membership for 24 years. If the mood does not change, the referendum would end doubts about Britain's future in the EU for years to come. Leaving the EU was not an issue in Britain. Something clearly went wrong. What was that? Well, we were going to have a referendum. That's what the Tory government uh, promised us in their manifesto. And just a few months before it was to take place, the official Remain campaign, Stronger In, came under strong criticism. Piola Biordona, the campaign director of the Wake Up Foundation, previously of British influence, wrote a stinging article against the official Stronger In campaign and said, what I and many other pro-Europeans are increasingly concerned about is the progress of the official pro-EU campaign so far. What she meant was she was concerned about the lack of progress. <laughs> At the time, I volunteered my services to the Stronger In campaign. They didn't want me. They didn't want many people who applied to offer their services. They clearly thought at that time that winning would be a piece of cake. But obviously, it wasn't. Because not only were they disorganized, but also they had the problem of the press, which was no longer pro-EU, pro-European community, as it was in 1975. For years, our press, particularly the Daily Express and the Daily Mail, were against migrants and against the EU. They had spread a lot of stories, front page stories, that promoted xenophobia in this country and a hatred of migrants and a hatred of the European Union. So here we are, migrants cost Britain 17 billion a year. Actually, it's the other way around. EU migrants contribute hugely to our treasury. Daily Mail, migrants spark housing crisis. It isn't true. Yes, we have a lack of affordable housing in Great Britain. Some hospitals are under huge pressure, but that isn't the fault of migrants. If the train is full, do you blame the passengers or the train company for not putting on enough trains? We should not blame a scapegoat migrants, and it's not the fault of the EU if we don't have enough affordable houses. 
And another one, quit the EU to save our NHS. Absolutely ridiculous. Without EU migrants and other migrants working for our NHS, we wouldn't have one. And then, of course, there was the outrageous Sun front page, Queen backs Brexit. And Buckingham Palace complained to the press regulator and won. This was an untrue headline. And all these uh, newspaper front pages were wrong. If it was just the four of them, it wouldn't be so bad. But we have a daily deluge by our press, the majority of our press, unfortunately, promoting hatred of migrants and misinformation about the EU. So clearly, this was having a huge impact. Now, combine that with a well-funded Leave campaign who had to rely on lies to win. That doesn't say much for their arguments, but their lies did win. The biggest lie of all, promoted by Boris Johnson, that he took the bus around the country, was that we send the EU £350 million a week and let's fund our NHS instead. Well, we do not send that amount of money every week to the EU because we get a rebate, and that's deducted at source. We never send it. The government can spend it how they want. And what's more, we get a lot of money back. And the other thing is, we get something for the money. We buy membership of a club. If you go and join a gym, you're not expecting them to give you loads of money back. You're paying for the service that you're, you get. So that was wrong. And then there was another one. Turkey is joining the EU soon. People started to get scared that 76 million people were about to descend from Turkey to here. It was very similar to Nigel Farage's claim when uh, Bulgaria and Romania uh, joined the EU and were entitled to work here. And he said them, 30 million Bulgarians and Romanians will be entitled to come to Britain. I did a big story at the time because the Daily Mail claimed that all the planes and buses from Bulgaria and Romania were full up with Bulgarians and Romanians wanted to come here. I phoned up the planes and buses and were able to get seats on all of them. It was completely untrue. I complained to the press regulator and seven months later I won. But the point is that we will never have 30 million Bulgarians and Romanians coming here and we'll never have 76 million Turkish people coming here, even if Turkey was joining, which they're not, not in our lifetime, for one simple reason. And that is we'll never have 30 million job vacancies in this country and that's the reason people come here to do jobs that we do not have enough Britons to do. It's as simple as that. And if there are no jobs, then in the main, they either don't come or don't stay. So that was wrong too. And this was something that Boris Johnson also promoted quite heavily during the EU referendum, that Turkey would be joining soon. Well, this lie, and I can call it a lie, even though Boris Johnson is still promoting it, this lie was critical even though there were many, many lies by the Leave campaign. And now, Dominique Cummings, the campaign director for Vote Leave, said after the referendum, would we have won without that £300 million claim? And he said, all our research and the close result strongly suggests no. This country is changing direction forever based on a lie. We need to take that on board. And as for Boris Johnson saying that Turkey is going to join soon. Well, after the referendum, he said he was going to help Turkey to join. How ironic was that? If I'd written this in a novel five years ago, you would just think it's nonsense. Well, the Stronger In campaign did try. They, they had facts, they had forecasts, and they had fear. Probably too much. And they, they didn't have panache, they didn't have a sparkle, they didn't have a focus, they didn't have the same slogans. Now look at these posters that I got together about the Stronger In campaign. Leave Europe and we lose our seat at the table. Don't give up our place in the world. Britain is stronger in Europe. I don't remember this poster during the EU campaign and I think it washes over people's head. It's not strong enough. And then there was this other one. Leave in Europe will be a leap in the dark, don't risk it. Fine. But I don't think this poster had the same impact as the bus. We needed something, but not a lie. We needed some truth on a bus. And who can remember this one with Nigel Farage cutting a branch and they're going to fall off? Well, it could be a bit amusing, but I don't even know what it means. I don't even remember it, and I don't think it's very effective. But I don't think that the Remain campaign fibbed. I don't think they lied. I think they were too heavily involved with forecasts 
and Project Fear, and I think that they did give us facts, and they were criticised. But the point is that Project Fear is becoming Project Reality now, and their forecasts grossly related to what would happen after Brexit, when we've left. And I think that their forecasts will turn out to be correct, and if anything, underestimated the harm that will happen to Britain after we have left the European Union. There were also a large number of other groups, not strongly, and unofficial groups, that tried to get Britain to stay in the EU. For instance, the sterling work of journalists at Infax that did a lot of articles during the referendum campaign to try and give the facts about the EU and to challenge the misinformation of the Leave campaign. And actually, there were a huge number of groups campaigning for Britain to stay in the EU. For example, the New Europeans, Scientists for EU, the European movement. Great work, but why didn't we come together? And why didn't Stronger In get us to work together? We were all fragmented. It was a tragedy. We should have worked more together. I also started a small grassroots Facebook campaign called Reasons to Remain. I used my skills as an investigative journalist to put together a series of articles and posters to put the case for us staying in, and a series, for example, called Fact and Fiction. Fact or Fiction, leave campaigners say that the EU accounts have never been signed off. They are balanced and signed off by the independent auditors every year. Every year, and yet they can still have the barefaced cheek to put this lie across to the British people. Leave campaigners say that the EU is run by unelected bureaucrats. It's not. The EU is run by the 28 members of the European Union and their parliaments. Every single treaty of the EU has been debated and passed by a parliament in Westminster. But you wouldn't think that reading some of our press. And the biggest problem I have in telling this to people, to Brexiters, the one response that I have that is very difficult to reply to is, I don't believe you. Although this is, you don't have to take my word for it, it's so easily, <laughs> easy to research this. When on the 24th of June, we either woke up or we'd been up all night to discover that the country had been literally split in two. The Remain side only got 48% and the Leave side got 52%, wafer thin. This was almost half and half. And one half of the United Kingdom Scotland and Northern Ireland voted in to stay in the European Union, and England and Wales voted out. But then with cities across England and Wales voting in or out, London very strongly uh, wanted to stay in. This was a disaster for our country, causing huge uh, rifts across the country. Even families are split up, friends are split up as a result of this. It's a tragedy, really. This was totally different to that first referendum in 1975, when the result was a margin of almost 35% for people wanting to stay in the European community. That, we can say, was a truly decisive result. Not this one we've had in 2016, where the margin was barely 4% margin for people who wanted to leave the European Union. That, we can say, was a divisive result. And I don't know yet how we're going to heal from this. This is the problem of referendums. I don't like them. Margaret Thatcher didn't like them. Clement Attlee didn't like them. They called them the device of dictators because we have a parliamentary representative democracy. And frankly, they are incompatible. That's incompatible with referendums, direct democracy. Because what happens now? Who, who has the higher vote on this? Parliament or the referendum, which was only meant to be advisory? So look at it this way, 46 and a half million people were registered to vote in the EU referendum of 2016. 46 and a half million people. But only 37% of them voted to leave, a minority. And in those that didn't include people who voted remain and people who didn't vote. And some people will say, well, you didn't vote, you lost your voice. You don't have a right to complain. But look at it this way. The question of whether Britain should stay in the European Union was extremely complicated. 
we were not equipped to be able to give an answer. In fact, I was talking to someone here uh, in the audience who said he didn't know. And how can anyone really blame uh, a non-voter when he or she would say, in response to the question, should we stay in, I don't know. And in most democracies across the world where they do have a referendum that can change the constitution, they require a majority of voters. And you would never get a change on only 37%. In fact, the irony is that this result would not have been sufficient to change the constitution of UKIP or to change the constitution of the Conservative Party. So you could say, why didn't Parliament set a threshold, as they would have done in other democracies, to say, we need a majority of voters to vote for leaving, if that's what you want. Because the status quo, 43 years in the European Union, that is the status quo. Could Parliament have done that? Yes, it could, because it did do that in the 1979 referendum on whether to have a Scottish Assembly. And the result then was exactly the same. 52% said yes, and 48% said no. But yes didn't win. We didn't have a Scottish Assembly in 1979 because Parliament had set a threshold. Parliament had said that there would have to be a threshold of at least 40%, and only around 33% of the electorate voted for yes, so it didn't pass. They didn't set this threshold, unfortunately, for the referendum in 2016, but they could have done. I think they should have done. And in 2016, it was the same result, 52%, 48%, 37% of the registered voters voted for leave, and it got through this time because Parliament hadn't set a minimum threshold. And minimum thresholds are important, but for some reason it wasn't for this referendum. When Theresa May called for a snap general election, she could only get one if there was a two-thirds majority of all MPs in the House of Commons. She would not have had an early general election if only 37% of MPs. So it seems fine for them, but not for the rest of the country. On the morning of the 24th of June, 2016, David Cameron, outside number 10 Downing Street, tendered his resignation. He tendered his resignation because he had lost. He had promoted remain and lost. But on that basis, the entire government should have resigned because the Conservative government promoted remain. The Conservative government, official pamphlet to everyone, urged the country to vote for remain. But he left and left behind the others. And so we had, in effect, a takeover. We had an unelected government of sorts, because here we had Theresa May as Prime Minister, unelected. Now, I know we don't elect Prime Ministers directly in this country, but she was going to try and have a new government on an entirely different manifesto than the one the Conservatives had won under David Cameron. And look at this. 70% of her cabinet, including her, had urged the country to stay in the European Union and told us that it was in our best interest and that leaving would damage the country. Just seven greyed out were leavers. The rest were all strong Remainers. But after the referendum, suddenly they morphed into Brexiters. What happened to principles, I wonder? So there is now two-faced Tories. They weren't in it for principles. What were they in it for? I think power. But look at some of these. For example, before the EU referendum, Theresa May said, I believe it's clearly in our national interest to remain a member of the European Union. But after the referendum, she said, leaving the EU presents us with a world of opportunities, and I'm determined to seize them. Before the referendum, Jeremy Hunt, the health secretary, said, a strong NHS needs a strong economy. We should not put that at risk with Brexit. But after the referendum, he said, Brexit can be a great catalyst for change in health and social care. These are the same people, but with different policies now. And before the referendum, Boris Johnson, sporting his uh, President Trump hairstyle, <laughs> said it's surely a boon for the world and for Europe, that Britain should be intimately engaged in the EU. He wrote that in a column for the Telegraph when he thought that he would be supporting the Remain campaign, then hovered and decided that it was in his best interests not to. And after the referendum, he said, we want to engage with the world again in a way that we haven't been able to do for 43 years. This is a myth. 
Because in the EU, we have the best of both worlds. In the EU, we can trade with our most important customers and suppliers right on our doorstep where almost 50% of our um, imports and exports come from and go to. And we can have trade with the rest of the world. It doesn't have to be and has never been either or. So this was a myth. And then we had David Davis. Before the referendum, he said, if a democracy cannot change its mind, it ceases to be a democracy. He said that in 2012, when he was desperate to get another referendum to get us out of the EU. But now we're out, he doesn't want to give us another chance in case we change our mind. Because after the referendum, he said, there must be no attempt to remain in the EU, no attempt to rejoin by the back door, and no second referendum. Clearly, he's pro-democracy. <laughs> so now we had a new prime minister with a different manifesto pulling the strings of parliament because she wanted to avoid parliament at all costs. She wanted to pass Brexit by bypassing parliament. Why? If Brexit's such a wonderful thing, why not allow it to be uh, open to scrutiny? She also wanted to decide what leave meant. Nobody knew what leave meant in the EU referendum. We still don't know. So she's going to decide for us without us having any further say in the matter. But then she was still under the auspices of the 2015 Tory manifesto that got her and her government into power. And in that manifesto, it wasn't for Brexit. There was nothing about Brexit in that manifesto apart from a promise to have a referendum. That manifesto said, our aim is to make Britain the best place to do business in Europe. Of course, you can only do that in the EU. It said, we are clear about what we want from Europe. We say yes to the single market. The manifesto said yes to a family of nations, all part of the European Union. And the manifesto said, we want to expand the single market, breaking down the remaining barriers to trade and ensuring that new sectors are opened up to British firms. So when I say that Theresa May's new government after the referendum was unelected, they changed the manifesto without a vote. Their manifesto actually was pro-EU, and although it promised to have a referendum, they didn't think they would lose it, and it was pro-EU in that manifesto. Well, thanks to Gina Miller and her colleagues and supporters, she challenged Theresa May's plan to bypass Parliament to get Brexit decided. The High Court and the Supreme Court agreed that this would be illegal. Only Parliament could decide to take us out of the EU. The referendum was advisory only. It wasn't legally binding. Parliament had to be the decider of this, and Theresa May lost. So we had a vote in Parliament. We had a vote to trigger Article 50. But some lawyers are very critical of this because that's not really a debate or a bill or a vote on whether Britain should leave. This was a vote on whether we should give them the notice letter. That's totally different. And then, all of a sudden, Theresa May sought a snap general election for which she needed a two-thirds majority in Parliament. She said she needed a bigger mandate to be able to fulfill her Brexit plan. She thought that she would win a landslide and she thought that she would increase her majority in the House of Commons. The opposite happened, big shock. She lost her majority entirely and she had to do some form of deal with a small Northern Ireland party to be able to continue in power a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. And you would think any person who is a statesperson, who is pro-democracy, would take this as an opportunity to pause and think, the country's not behind me. The country doesn't actually want the Brexit I've designed because no one knew what Brexit meant and they don't really want the Brexit that I'm thinking of. But she didn't take that opportunity. She decided that she would carry on regardless as if the general election hadn't ever happened. Well, now, of course, they don't want us to have a second chance. They don't want us to have any opportunity to reconsider. And Dr. Liam Fox, the Secretary of State for International Trade, said, there's about as much chance of us staying in the European Union as of me finding the tooth ferry. Well, Dr. Fox, you should think again. <laughs> of course, it's a complete shambles. Britain is not prepared. They're negotiating 
but not with the EU. They're negotiating with each other. They don't know in the cabinet what sort of leave they want. They can't agree with each other. And it's quite clear that there's a division here between the EU on the left and David Davis on his team on the right. It's clear that one is prepared and the other is unprepared. And now the government wants to do what the opposition parties call a power grab. They don't want Parliament to be involved in what laws we will retain after Brexit. They're going to put thousands of laws and EU protections into British law, and then they don't want Parliament to have anything more to do with it. They want their own ministers to be able to decide which of those thousands of EU laws and protections we keep, we change, or we scrap. Democracy, rest in peace. Now, what is this all about? I'll tell you what I think this is about. I think this is about a power grab. I don't think that the Brexit campaigners ever thought they would win. And now they've won. They don't want to let go of it because they know that next time, if it was ever put to a vote, they would lose. And it gives me no joy to say that I predicted as much in my article for The Independent before last year's referendum in which I said, you won't get back to your country if you vote for Brexit. You'll give it to the most right-wing UK government in recent history. And here we are. So we come back to the original question, can Brexit be stopped? Well, of course it can, if that's what Britain wants. And of course, we need an opportunity to be able to express that. Brexiters say, you, you can't do that. You, you can't change your mind. The decision was made, that's democracy. But you can be sure that if Remain had won last year, Brexiters would now still be campaigning for Britain to leave, and I would expect them to, because that's what happens in a democracy. You lose, but you carry on campaigning. Unless you're part of the Tory cabinet, you don't lose your beliefs and principles. You carry on to campaign for what you believe in. That is what democracy does. And of course, how do I know that the Brexiters would carry on? Well, look at what Nigel Farage said in May, before the referendum, he said, in a 52-48 referendum, this would be unfinished business by a long way. He said if it was 52-48% for Remain, which is why he said this, he would demand another referendum. A lot of hypocrisy involved with this referendum. Some lawyers think that we can actually defeat Brexit, stop Brexit, slow Brexit, dent Brexit legally because there's so many legal flaws in the process, and that could be true. For example, the notice letter that Theresa May sent to the EU, the Article 50 notice, many lawyers now say that was invalid because actually Parliament never made a proper decision for us to leave the EU, so she had no entitlement to send this letter. The government told Parliament that the decision had been made by the referendum, but the referendum was not capable of making such a decision because the referendum was advisory only. So Parliament never had a proper vote or a proper bill uh, or even debate on actually whether Britain should leave. The same question should have been asked to Parliament that we were asked, and it never had that. So that could be an end of Brexit. There are also other legal challenges to Brexit. For example, there were many British people across the EU who were denied a vote, even though in the Tory manifesto they promised that all British citizens living abroad would get a vote. Up till then, it was a 15-year rule. If you'd been living abroad for more than 15 years, you wouldn't have a vote. The Tories promised to scrap it. They didn't fulfill their promise. Many people couldn't vote. And, you know, there were about citizens from 70 different countries living in Britain who could vote in the EU referendum, but most EU citizens living here couldn't. And that's a hangover from our past. These are mostly people with leave to remain in Britain who are part of our Commonwealth and old empire. It was very undemocratic, in my view. But I have to say that if there was a legal challenge that stopped Brexit, it wouldn't, in my view, be satisfactory. On its own, it wouldn't help the situation. It could cause a huge problem across the country. It wouldn't settle or resolve this problem for a generation, which is what we want. It would make people feel very uncomfortable and think that their, their democratic vote was being mocked. So I don't actually think a legal solution, although it could uh, maybe help to slow things down, would resolve the issue at all. So I think that for Britain to change the course of Brexit, it requires Britain to change its mind. 
Uh, I think that actually when only 37% of registered voters voted for Brexit, it's wrong to say it's the will of the people. It's not the will of the people. And many people living in Britain, when you think 17 million people voted for Leave, but that's not a majority in a country with 65 million people living in it. Uh, I would say the majority of people living in Britain today do not want Brexit. Many of them didn't vote because they didn't know what to vote for, and many of them couldn't vote, which seems very unfair. So I've prepared 10 steps to stop Brexit, democratically and legitimately, because we want to draw a line under this. That's the way we have to do it. It cannot be a legal challenge on its own. And the first thing we have to do is to realize that it can be stopped in a democracy if enough British people decide it should be stopped. That's the challenge. In a democracy, you have to use the power of persuasion. And if we persuade enough people to vote our way, we win. And if we don't, we lose. Changing minds is the key to stopping Brexit. We have to persuade Britain to do a reversal of Brexit. It's a case of getting over and winning our arguments, which we failed to do in the referendum. But we, we should have a second chance. If you lose a vote, you don't just give up. You pick yourself up and hope and plan to win the next vote. And in a democracy, there is always a next vote eventually, sooner or later. And I think it probably will be sooner rather than later, because I reckon that we will have a general election in due course. Now look at this. A quarter of all Britons who back Brexit believe they were misled by the Leave campaign and almost one in ten now say that they would change their vote if a second EU referendum was held. This was based on an opinion poll published in HuffPost. So things are starting to change. The mood can change and it can change even more if we work at it. And another report from The Independent based on another poll that said the majority of Britons now want a second referendum on the UK quitting the European Union, according to a new survey. Anything's possible. And in democracy, anything is possible. As far as we know, only the laws of physics can't be changed. And of course, as well as democracy being on our side by trying to win over people to our side of the argument, we also possibly have demography on our side because I know a lot of older people don't like me saying this, and I'm sorry, I'm going to say it again, is that it was the older voters that caused Brexit by a long way. The over 50s voted for Brexit in the main, and the under 50s didn't. The 18 to 24-year-olds, by a massive 75%, according to many different polls, voted for Remain. And those over 65 61% of them voted for leave. And older people outnumber young people by two to one. So that was a massive thing. If older people had voted for Remain in the majority, Brexit would never have happened. And the point is this, and I don't wish harm on anybody. Everyone has the right to their point of view. <laughs> but, but as older people leave and die and younger people come of age, the future of Britain is to remain or to rejoin the European Union, because that's in the main what young people want. And it will be young people who inherit Britain. So maybe it's better that way round than the other way round. Young people want us in Europe. They don't want to shrink their horizons. They don't want to lose the right to live, work, study, or retire across our continent. Britons may say stop if Brexit causes pain. Well, it does. And I think it will. I feel the experts are right. The majority of experts say Brexit will cause us huge damage. We will be poorer, our country and us individually, as a result of Brexit. And explaining Brexit as the direct cause of pain will be essential to any new campaign because, you know, already the anti-EU newspapers, which is most of them, unfortunately, are saying that the EU wants to punish us. This is the most ridiculous idea. Because all they're saying to us is that we cannot expect to have EU membership benefits as an ex-member. That, to me, is pretty much common sense. Uh, so, so they're not punishing us. They're just saying, you can't have your cake and eat it, Mr. Johnson. And Britons need to be persuaded that the pain will stop if Brexit is stopped. Well, a lot of people voted leave because they were told, they thought, that their lives would be better if only we didn't have so many foreigners here 
and if only we didn't belong to the EU. Well, EU migrants in Britain represent just 5% of our population. That is hardly mass immigration, and the vast majority of them are in gainful employment, making a massive contribution to our treasury. And the EU is not the cause of our problems, but their lives won't get better after Brexit. It will get worse, I believe. And so we need to be able to persuade them that this pain of Brexit making us poorer will come to an end if only we come to our senses. And then Britons need a better vision of hope than the one Brexit falsely offered them. The problem in Britain today is that we have poor areas of the country, people using food banks, people who are underemployed or zero hour contracts who are not having a decent life. It is not the fault of migrants and the EU. We should not be scapegoating them. It's the fault of our politicians. We shouldn't let them off the hook. We need successive governments to invest billions into the infrastructure of Great Britain, into more training for our workforce, for more affordable homes, for more hospitals. We need all that, and none of that is to do with migrants or the EU. And unfortunately, that hasn't been properly understood yet. In fact, by voting Brexit, we're letting our political masters off the hook, and we shouldn't do that. And a new campaign needs to reach out to the moderate, fair-minded, middle-of-the-road Britons, who are the majority. In my view, the 17 million or so who voted for Leave are not bigots, they're not racists. They believed, sincerely believed, that voting for Leave was in the best interest of the country and themselves. They were told it was and they believed it. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I blame the politicians who told the lies and not the people who bought them. And Brexit won't be stopped by trying to persuade the ardent Brexiters who are very loud, who come onto my Facebook page and tell us to shut up and stop. They're not that many of them. I think they're in a minority and they don't represent the vast majority of people who voted for Leave. And there needs to be a new, serious and determined alliance of anti-Brexit parties and politicians. Well, Vince Cable, the new leader of the Liberal Democrats, said, when we know what Brexit means, the people should get the choice, the government deal or an exit from Brexit. Well, I agree with him. Unfortunately, they haven't got many MPs. Their fortunes may be turned around. We don't know. But there's a good chance that the Lib Dems may work with another party. Maybe a general election will be around the corner because not many parties last long without a majority. Labour have recently changed their position. They now say we should stay in the single market in the customs union after we have Brexited. We would continue to pay for access. We will continue to obey the rules. We will continue to have free movement of people for three or four years to soften the blow. But it doesn't end the blow. It's still going to come. The cliff edge is still going to be there. And finally, a campaign needs to win a new democratic opportunity for Britons to reconsider Brexit. Because if we change the mood of the country, which I think is the job we need to do, it's pointless unless we have a democratic opportunity for that new mood to be expressed. I think it could be a general election quite soon. So we need to campaign now. And we need to make sure that the right politicians get into Parliament who can change the course of Brexit, either to soften it or to stop it. Now, over the last year, I set up my small grassroots Reasons to Remain campaign on Facebook. We've now produced over 1,000 Reasons to Remain in the EU. We are trying our best to persuade Britain to change its mind. And of course, we need you to pass them on, because the only way that we will change this to turn it around legitimately for another generation is to persuade the nation to turn around Brexit. Because the EU referendum campaign was flawed. The country was misled. The antidote to lies is the truth. And the truth normally prevails in the end. But we don't have much time. Britain is due to leave the European Union at the stroke of midnight on the 29th of March, 2019. So our job now is to persuade Britain to do a U-turn on Brexit. That's what we have to do. And if we can do that and Britain changes its mind about Brexit, that will be the democratic process. That will be the new will of the people. Because in a true 
democracy, voters are allowed to change their minds. Thank you.